Chapter 8 The Halt at Tepeaca As Cortez had asked the caciques of Tlaxcala for 5,000 warriors in order to overrun and chastise the towns where Spaniards had been killed, namely Tepeaca and Quecholac and Tecamachalco, distant from Tlaxcala six or seven leagues, they got ready 4,000 Indians with the greatest willingness. Then, as we were all ready, we began our march. On that expedition we took neither artillery nor muskets, for all had been lost to the bridges, and for the few that were saved we had no powder. We had with us seventeen horses and six crossbows, and four hundred and twenty soldiers, most of them armed with sword and shield, and about two thousand friends of Tlaxcala. The next day we had a fine battle with the Mexicans and Tepeacans on a plain, and as the field of battle was among maize and magway plantations, although the Mexicans fought fiercely, they were soon routed by those on horseback, and those who had no horses were not behindhand. Then, to see with what spirit our Tlaxcalan allies attacked them and followed them up and overtook them, and many of the Mexicans and Tepeacans were slain, but of our Tlaxcalan allies only three were killed, and two horses were wounded, and one of them died, and two of our soldiers were wounded, but not in a manner to cause them any danger. Then we went to the town of Tepeaca, and founded a town there, which was named La Vía de Segura de la Frontera, because it was on the road to Villarica, and it stood in a good neighborhood of excellent towns subject to Mexico, and there was plenty of maize. We had our allies, the Tlaxcalans, to guard the frontier. There, alcaldes and regidores were chosen, and orders were given that the neighborhood subject to Mexico was to be raided, especially the towns where Spaniards had been killed, and iron was made with them with which to brand those whom we took for slaves. It was shaped thusly, which means guerra, war. From the Via Segura de la Frontera, we scoured the neighborhood which included Quetzalcoatl and Tecamachalco and the town of Guayabas and other towns of which I do not remember the names. It was in Quetzalcoatl that they had killed 15 Spaniards in their quarters, and here we made many slaves so that within 40 days we had all these towns punished and thoroughly subdued. At that time in Mexico they had raised up to the throne another prince, because the prince who had driven us out of Mexico had died of smallpox. He whom they now made lord over them was a nephew or very near relation of Montezuma named Guatemoc, a young man of about twenty-five years, very much of a gentleman for an Indian, and very valiant, and he made himself so feared that all his people trembled before him, and he was married to a daughter of Montezuma, a very handsome woman for an Indian. When this Guatemoc, prince of Mexico, learned that we had defeated the Mexican squadron stationed in Tepeaca, and that the people of Tepeaca had given their fealty to his majesty, and served us, and gave us food, and that we had settled there, he feared that we should overrun Oaxaca, and other provinces, and bring them all into our alliance. So he sent messengers through all the towns, and told them to be on the alert with all their arms, and he gave golden jewels to some caciques, and to others he remitted their tribute, and above all he dispatched great companies and garrisons of warriors to see that we did not enter his territory, and charged them to fight very fiercely against us, so that it should not happen again as it did at Tepeaca and Quetzalcoatl. Letters came to Cortes from Villarica to say that his ship had arrived in port, and that her captain was a gentleman named Pedro Barba, a great friend of Cortes. He brought with him only thirteen soldiers, a horse, and a mare, for the vessel that he came in was very small. He also brought letters for Panfilo de Narvé, in the belief that New Spain was now his, and in these letters Velasquez sent to tell him that if he had not already killed Cortes, that he should at once send him a prisoner to Cuba, so that he could be sent to Castile, for so it had been ordered by the Bishop of Burgos. As soon as Pedro Barba arrived in port with his ship and let go his anchor, Pedro Caballero went off to visit and welcome him in a boat, well manned by sailors with their arms hidden. They told Pedro Barba and his companions so many yarns that they induced them to go ashore in the boat, and when they had got them clear of their ship, Pedro Caballero said to Pedro Barba, Surrender in the name of Signor Captain Hernando Cortes, my commander. Thus they were captured, and they were thunderstruck. Then they sent Pedro Barba and his companions to where we were stationed with Cortes and Tepeaca, and we were delighted to receive them for the help that it brought us in the very nick of time. 
Cortez paid much honor to Pedro Barba and made him captain of the crossbowmen. Another small vessel arrived within eight days, and a gentleman named Rodrigo Morellon de Lobera came in her as captain, and brought with him eight soldiers and six crossbows and much twine for making bowstrings, and one mare. In exactly the same way that they had taken Pedro Barba, so did they take this Rodrigo Morejon, and they were sent at once to Segura de la Frontera, and we rejoiced to see all of them, and Cortez paid them much honor and gave them employment. Guatemoc, the chieftain who had recently been raised to be king of Mexico, was sending garrisons to his frontiers, and in particular he sent one very powerful and numerous body of warriors to Guacachula and another to Izacar, distant two or three leagues from Guacachula. It seems that this host of warriors committed many robberies and acts of violence against the inhabitants of those towns where they were quartered, so much so that four chieftains of Guacachula came very secretly to Cortez and asked him to send tools and horses to put a stop to these robberies and injuries which the Mexicans were committing, and said that all the people of that town and others in the neighborhood would aid us in slaying the Mexican squadrons. When Cortez heard this, he dispatched Cristobal de Olid as captain with nearly all the horsemen and crossbowmen and a large force of Tlaxcalans. Cortez also told off captains from among those who had come with Narve to accompany Captain Cristobal de Olid, so he took with him over three hundred soldiers and all the best horses that we had. About a league from Guacachula, the caciques of the town came out to tell them how and where the men of Culua were posted, and how they should be attacked, and in what way the Spaniards could be assisted, and they fell on the troops of Culua, and all the latter fought well for a good while, and wounded some of our soldiers, and killed two horses, and wounded eight more at some barricades and ditches that were in the town. Within an hour all the Mexicans were put to flight. Olid did not tarry long in that town, but went on at once to Issachar, and with those who could follow him, and with our allies from Guacachula, he crossed the river and fell on the Mexican squadrons and quickly defeated them. There they killed two horses and gave Olid two wounds, one of them in the thigh, and his horse was badly wounded. While we were stationed at Segura de la Frontera, letters reached Cortez to say that one of the ships with Francisco de Garay, the governor of Jamaica, had sent to form a settlement of Panuco, had come into port and that her captain was named Camargo, and that she brought over sixty soldiers, all of them ill, and very yellow and with swollen bellies. They brought the news that the other captain whom Garay had sent to settle at Panuco, whose name was Alvarez Pinedo, and all the soldiers and horses that had been sent to that province had been killed by the Indians, and their ships burned. This Camargo, seeing how badly things had turned out, re-embarked his soldiers and came for help to the port, for they knew well that we had settled there. It was because they had to endure the constant attacks of the Indians of Panuco that they had nothing to eat and arrived so thin and yellow and swollen. These soldiers and their captain came on very slowly, for they could not walk owing to their weakness, to the town of Frontera. When Cortez saw them so swollen and yellow, he knew that they were no good as fighting men and that we should hardly be able to cure them, and he treated them with much consideration. I fancy that Camargo died very soon, but I do not well remember what became of him, and many others of them died. And then for a joke we gave the others a nickname and called them the Veracruz Bellies, for they were the color of death, and their bellies were so swollen. One Miguel Diaz de Aouz arrived soon after, who had been sent as one of Francisco de Garay's captains to succor Captain Alvarez Pinedo, for he thought that Pinedo was at Panuco. When Miguel Diaz de Aouz arrived at the port of Panuco and found no vestige, neither hide nor hair of the armada of Garay, he understood at once from what he saw that they were all dead. The Indians of that province attacked Miguel Diaz as soon as he arrived with his ship, and for that reason he came on to our port and disembarked his soldiers, who numbered more than fifty with seven horses, and he soon arrived where we were stationed with Cortez. And this help was most welcome just at the time when we needed it most. A few days after Miguel Diaz de Aouz had come to port, another ship arrived in port which Garay had also sent to help and succor his expedition, believing that they were all safe and well in the Rio de Panuco. The captain who came in her was an old man named Ramirez, 
Thus, Francisco de Grey shot off one shaft after another to the assistance of his armada, and each one went to assist the good fortune of Cortes and of us. It was of the greatest help to us, and all these men came from Garay, as I have already said. They came to Tepeaca, where we were stationed. Because the soldiers brought by Miguel Diaz de Ouz arrived very hardy and fat, we called them the strong backs, and those who came with the elder Ramirez, who wore cotton armor so thick that no arrow could penetrate it, and it was very heavy, we called the pack saddles. When the captains and soldiers whom I have mentioned presented themselves before Cortes, he paid them much honor. Cortes had now an abundance of soldiers and horses and crossbows. He had received news that in some towns named Zocotla and Chalacinco, and in others in the neighborhood, many of the soldiers of Narve had been killed when on their way from Mexico, and also that it was in those towns that they had killed and stolen the gold from Juan de Alcantara and the other two settlers from the town of Yerica. Cortes and Gonzalo de Sandoval, the chief alguazil, as the captain of that expedition, a valiant man of good counsel, and he took with him two hundred soldiers, nearly all of them from us, the followers of Cortes, and twenty horsemen and twelve crossbowmen, and a large force of clash collins. Without relating anything more that happened on this expedition, I may say that the enemy were defeated, and the Mexicans and the caciques of those towns were put to flight. They found in the queues of that town clothes and armors and horses' bridles and two saddles, and other things belonging to horsemen which had been offered to the idols. Sandoval returned with a great spoil of women and boys who were branded as slaves, and Cortez was delighted when he saw him arrive strong and well, although eight soldiers had been badly wounded and three horses killed, and Sandoval himself had one arrow wound. I did not go on that expedition, as I was very ill with fever and was vomiting blood, and thank God I got well, for they bled me. When Gonzalo de Sandoval arrived at the town of Segura de la Frontera, after having made the expeditions I have spoken of, we had all the people of that province pacified, so Cortes decided with the officials of the king that all the slaves that had been taken should be branded so that his fifth might be set aside after the fifth had been taken for his majesty. And to this effect, he had a proclamation made in the town and camp that all the soldiers should bring to a house chosen for the purpose all the women whom we were sheltering to be branded, and the time allowed for doing this was the day of the proclamation and one more. We all came with all the Indian women and girls and boys whom we had captured, but the grown-up men we did not trouble about, as they were difficult to watch, and we had no need of their services, as we had our friends, the Tlaxcalans. When they had all been brought together, and had been marked with the iron which was like this, which stands for Guerra, when we were not expecting it, they set aside the royal fifth, and then took another fifth for Cortes, and in addition to this, the night before, after we had placed the women in that house, as I have stated, they took away and hid the best-looking Indian woman, and there was not a good-looking one left, and when it came to dividing them, they allotted us the old and ugly women, and there was a great deal of grumbling about it against Cortez, and those who ordered the good-looking Indian women to be stolen and hidden, so much so that some of the soldiers of Narvae said to Cortez himself that they took God to witness that such a thing had never happened as to have two kings in the country belonging to our lord the king, and to deduct two-fifths. One of the soldiers who had said this to him was Juan Bono de Gejo, and moreover he said that they would not remain in such a country, and that he would inform his majesty in Spain about it, and the royal council of the Indies. Another soldier told Cortes very clearly that it did not suffice to divide the gold which had been secured in Mexico in the way in which he had done it, for when he was dividing it he had said that it was three hundred thousand pesos that had been collected. And when we were fleeing from Mexico, he had ordered witness to be taken that there remained more than seven hundred thousand, and that now the poor soldier who had done all the hard work and was covered with wounds could not even have a good-looking Indian woman. Besides, the soldiers had given the Indian women skirts and chemises, and all those women had been taken and hidden away. Moreover, when the proclamation had been issued that they were to be brought and branded, it was thought that each soldier would have his woman returned to him, and they would be appraised according to the value of each in pesos, and that when they had been valued a fifth would be paid to his majesty, and there would not be any fifth for Cortes, and other complaints were made worse than these. When Cortes saw this, he said with smooth words that he swore on his conscience, for that was his usual oath, that from that time forward he would not act in that way, 
but that good or bad all the Indian women should be put up to auction, that the good-looking ones should be sold for so much, and those that were not good-looking for a lower price, so there should be no cause of quarrel with him. However, here in Tepeaca no more slaves were made, but afterwards in Texcoco it was done nearly in this manner, as I will relate further on. I will stop talking about this, and will refer to another matter almost worse than this of the slaves, which was that when on the night of sorrow we were fleeing from Mexico, Cortes declared before a king's notary that whoever should wish to take gold from what was left there might carry it off and welcome for their own, as otherwise it would be lost. As in our camp and town at Segura de la Frontera, Cortes got to know that there were many bars of gold, and that they were changing hands at play. And as the proverb has it, el oro y amores eran malos de encubrir. Gold and love affairs are difficult to hide. He ordered a proclamation to be made that under heavy penalty they should bring and declare the gold that had been taken, and that a third part of it should be returned to them, and if they did not bring it, all would be seized. Many of the soldiers who possessed gold did not wish to give it up, and some of it Cortes took as a loan, but more by force than by consent. And as nearly all the captains possessed gold, and even the officials of the king, the proclamation was all the more ignored and no more spoken of. However, this order of Cortes seemed to be very wrong. When the captains of Narve observed that now we had reinforcements both through those who had come from Cuba and those from Francisco de Guerrero had sent to join his expedition from Jamaica, and they saw that the towns of the province of Tepeaca were all at peace, after much discussion with Cortes and many promises and entreaties, they begged him to give them leave to return to the island of Cuba, as he had promised. Cortes promptly granted their request, and even promised them that if he regained New Spain and the city of Mexico that he would give his partner, Ante de Duero, much more gold than he had been given before, and he made similar promises to the other captains, especially to Augustine Bermudez, and he ordered them to be given supplies such as could be procured at that time, maize and salted dogs, and a few fowls, and one of the best ships. Cortes wrote to his wife, Doña Catalina Juarez, La Marcaida, and to Juan Juarez, his brother-in-law, who at that time lived in the island of Cuba, and sent them some bars and jewels of gold, and told them about all the disasters and hardships that had happened to us, and how we had been driven out of Mexico. When Cortes gave the men leave to go, we asked him why he gave it, as we who remained behind were so few, and he replied that it was to avoid brawls and importunities, and that we could see for ourselves that some of those who were returning were not fit for warfare, and that it was better to remain alone than in useless company. Cortes sent Pedro de Alvarado to dispatch them from the port, and told him that after they were embarked he was to return at once to the town. I will now say that he also sent Diego de Erdar Alonso de Mendoza to Castile, with certain messages from himself, and I do not know if he sent any from us, for he did not tell us a thing about the business that he was negotiating with his majesty. Cortes also sent Alonso de Arvila to the island of Santo Domingo to give an account of all that had happened to the royal audiencia. I well know that some inquiring readers will ask how, without money, could Diego de Arda be sent on business to Castile, for it is clear that in Castile and elsewhere money is a necessity, and in the same way how could Alonso de Arvila and Francisco Alvarez del Chico be sent on business to Santo Domingo and to the island of Jamaica for horses and mares? I may answer this that when we were fleeing from Mexico by Cortes' orders, more than eighty Tlaxcalan Indians were laden with gold, and they were amongst the first who got clear of the bridges, so that it is clear that many loads of it were saved, and it was not all lost on the causeway. Let us leave this subject, and I will say that now, as all the hounds in the neighborhood of Tepeaca were at peace, Cortes settled that one Francisco de Orozco should stay in our town of Segura de la Frontera as captain, with a batch of twenty soldiers who were wounded or ill, and that all the rest of the army should go to Tlaxcala. He also gave orders that timber should be cut for the building of thirteen launches so that we could return to Mexico again, for we knew for certain that we could never master the lake without launches, nor carry on war, nor enter that great city another time by the causeways, without great risk to our lives. He who was the expert to cut the wood and make the model and the measurement to give instructions how the launches were to be fast sailors and of light draft for their special purpose, and the one who built them was Martin Lopez, 
who certainly, besides being a good sailor in all the wars, served his majesty well in this matter of the launches, and worked at them like a strong man. When we arrived at Tlaxcala, our great friend Maze Escazi had died of smallpox. We all grieved over his death very much, and Cortez said he felt it as though it were the death of his own father, and he put on mourning of black cloth, and so did many of our captains and soldiers, Cortez and all of us paid much honor to the children in relation to Maziascazi. As there were disputes in Tlaxcala about the cacique ship in command, Cortez ordered and decreed that it should go to a legitimate son of Maziascazi, or so his father had ordered before he died, and he had also said to his sons and relations that they should take care always to obey the commands of Malinche and his brethren, for we were certainly those who were destined to govern the country, and he gave the mother good advice. Jicotenga the Elder and Chichimecatecla, and nearly all the other caciques of Tlaxcala offered their services to Cortez, both in the matter of cutting wood for the launches and anything else he might order for the war against Mexico. Cortez embraced them with much affection and thanked them for it, especially Jicotenga the Elder and Chichimecatecla, and soon persuaded them to become Christians, and the good old Jicotenga, with much willingness, said that he wished to be a Christian, and he was baptized by the Padre de la Merced, with the greatest ceremony that at that time it was possible to arrange in Tlaxcala, and was given the name Don Lorenzo Vargas. Let us go back to speak of the launches. Martin Lopez made such speed in cutting the wood, with the great assistance of rendered to him by the Indians, that he had the whole of it cut within a few days, and each beam marked for the position for which it was intended to occupy, after the manner that the master carpenters and boat builders have of marking it. He was also assisted by another good soldier named Andre Nunez, and an old carpenter who was lame from a wound called Ramirez the Elder. Then Cortez sent to Villarica for much of the iron and the bolts of the ships which we had destroyed, and for anchors, sails, and rigging, and for cables and tow, and all the other material for building ships, and he ordered all the blacksmiths to come, and one Hernando de Aguilar, who was half a blacksmith and helped in the forging. Cortez sent a certain Santa Cruz as captain to Villarica with orders to bring all the material I have mentioned. He brought everything, even to the cauldrons for melting the pitch, and all the things that they had taken out of the ships, and transported them with the help of more than a thousand Indians, for all the towns of those provinces were enemies of the Mexicans, and at once gave men to carry the loads. Then, as we had no pitch with which to caulk the launches, and the Indians did not know how to extract it, Cortez ordered four sailors who understood the work to go and make pitch in some fine pine woods near Huechotzingo. As soon as Cortez saw that the timber for the launches was cut, and the persons named by me had started for Cuba, he settled that we should go with all our soldiers to the city of Texcoco. Over this there were many and great discussions, for some of the soldiers said that there was a better position, and better canals and ditches in which to build the sloops at Ayotzingo near Chalco than in the ditch and lake at Texcoco, and others contended that Texcoco was the better, as it was near to many other towns, and that when we held that city in our power, we could make expeditions to the country in the vicinity of Mexico, and that once stationed in that city, we could form a better opinion as to how things were going on. The news now reached us that a large ship had arrived from Spain in the Canary Islands, laden with a great variety of merchandise, muskets, powder, crossbows, and crossbow cords, and three horses and other arms. Cortez sent at once to buy all the arms and powder and everything else that she carried, and Juan de Burgos, the owner of the ship, and Amidal, the sailing master, and all the passengers on board soon came to our camp and we were very well satisfied at receiving such timely assistance.